Good evening, everybody. Welcome to week four of Advanced Programming with Java here at Portland State University. Uh, tonight, uh, we uh, begin what I consider to be the second half of the course. Maybe it's the middle third of the course. Um, in, in, in that, we're going to be learning about developing web applications in Java. Um, and so tonight's course, uh, tonight's class will be uh, different. Actually, it's a lot like the first class where we got our environment set up and we, we try out some things. You probably see some things that you haven't seen before. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start out with Prime Minister's questions. And then I'm going to walk you through uh, getting started with Project 4. Um, I want to make sure that you know, I, give you, I give you the information now so you can get started, so you can make sure that your, uh, you know, your Maven project works and everything like that, even though you know, given that the fact that, hey, you know, project three is still in progress, you've got uh, the cones to uh, to finish up also, uh, you may not start on project four right away, but I want to make sure that you uh, you know, have the ability to just double check that everything's working. So uh, we'll do that, and realistically, that'll probably take uh, 90 minutes, maybe as many as two hours, um, to sort of talk about that, get everybody uh, up and running there. But then we'll use the remainder of our time, of our time for our second pair of programming activity. Um, as I said last time, pair programming is, uh, it, it, you only need to have one uh, session required to inform uh, the quiz, which is the reflection on your uh, experience of pair programming. Um, so, you know, you, use your time appropriately. If you want to stick around, get some more experience pair programming, that's awesome. Um, but also, hey, if you've got, you know, other things to, to, to work on or just want to catch up with some sleep or just need a break here at the end of what I'm sure it's a long day, um, do that too. You know, use your time. Uh, as you will, as your time, uh, we're all adults here. So let's dive right into the Prime Minister's questions. Um, uh, there were a couple that came in from chat, and I wanted to start with those people because they've been uh, waiting. Um, and so then, uh, Joseph Fletcher, you had asked about start and date times. You want to come off mute, though, and maybe ask your question in, uh, in, in real time? Um, yeah, I'm just looking at project three with the uh, get begin time and get end times. Yes. Uh, a couple questions with that. So it says you need to use the date form or dot short. Um, looking online, I couldn't really find any examples where they explicitly used that as a like a format style. Um, yeah, can we can we just use a simple date format? I mean, I'm just kind of curious trying to figure that out. Yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, so here. Yeah. Yeah, basically what you, you end up doing is you'll have uh, now the project change your constructor, or maybe you won't. Anyway, you, you'll store um, you'll store the, uh, the, the like the begin well the begin uh, beginning of the appointment as a job util date, and I'll just see if I can yeah that's like so let's say that you have a date called the begin. And then you'll use, uh, let's see here, uh, date format dot get date time instance with date format dot short for both of these. So I, I don't know what resources you saw online. There is some background on this in the in the slides. Oops. Uh, sorry, and that needs to I mean, say format. Uh, you'll need to do something that looks like that. So the idea, the date format has this like static factory method that uh, takes two values. One is the style for the date and the style for the time. Um, have those both be date format dot short. Now what this will do is return a date formatter that then formats the uh, whatever date you pass into the format method using date format short. Okay, so that's kind of my second part of the question is you yep. actually want that this method to now return a date instead of a string? Nope, it still returns a string because what oh, format returns okay. is a string. Uh, you'll also then override the like get get begin time method so you put that into a field and then uh, yeah do that there. Okay. Yeah. Yep. That's uh, and this is you know gets you experience um, with, uh, with with date uh, API and date format API. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Let's see here and let's see here. Uh, 
Arsha, you, you wait in that conversation, or is there anything else you wanted to ask about? Uh, no, uh, uh, I was able to ask the survey thing, and uh, that's it. Yeah, I'm good. Hi, David. I have a doubt. Yes. Uh, so, how do you assert assertions that you throw in any function? Like, if you throw illegal argument exception, how do you test that in yes. the. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see here. I think there were a couple of examples of that. There might have been one. Is it student test? Uh, no, I must have. No, oh, wait a second. <laughs> Sorry, that is something else's code. Let's go find my code. Um, is there one student test? Nope. Um, wait a second. That's something else to go to. This is mine. This is mine. This is mine. Okay. Uh, there's an assert throws. Nope. I was finding someplace else. So there, there is a. Um, this is a J unit. It is not a ham crest thing. Uh, oh, it's an appointment test apparently. So I think about a better uh, example is this. Um, empty file cannot be parsed method. So this was a, a test that I wrote uh, over the weekend, I in the last couple of days, that showed how you can use, how you can get files as resources. And the whole idea of this test is that uh, this is a this is an empty file. Uh, this is an empty file. And when we try to parse it, uh, when we call the parse method, parse method throws parser exception. And so the way that you express this is that you use the assert throws. The first argument to uh, assert throws is the class of the expected exception. So in this place, parser exception dot class. And then the second argument is this thing called an executable. An executable is, um, a, uh, is, 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 a, is an inter interface in, in the JUnit API. Um, and It's executable. Um, and then uh, this is where your, your code that uh, gets executed goes here in this. Um, and so this creates an anonymous inner class that implements that executable. But IntelliJ is telling me that I can replace that with either a lambda or even better, I can parse it with something called a method reference. And that's in the, I think this stuff is all discussed in the, the Java 8. Uh, lecture. It's all part of the streams API, all part of lambdas, those language features and stuff. So, um, but basically you use this assert throws. It takes and says, hey, assert that um, the parser exception is thrown when I call parser.parse. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cody asked, do you get weird looks from neighbors while out there? Um, but they haven't said anything yet. So I've got enough of a buffer and my neighbors keep it themselves. We'll find out. Hey, can I, can I ask a quick question? Please do. Uh, so um, uh, in Python, we, uh, we used to write like, uh, what are the files in, the, in a particular directory? We used to write os.lister. So uh, what's the equivalent of that in Java? I mean, uh, I searched for that, but I, I didn't find any uh, anything good, so. Sure. Um, let's see here. Uh, there is, I'll just write some code, I guess, that'll do that. Um, so we'll say uh, print uh, files in critical directory. So uh, there is, let's see here. There, I think there's something on the files method, actually. Is there, I think you can do like find, do list. Um, that's one way of doing it. So and that uses the path API. This is all mentioned in maybe again the Java 8 lecture. Um, there's an older school way of doing it, uh, which is uh, directory equals new file uh, system vector. Just make sure that's right. 
kita paham seperti ini coba kita lihat Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. So, yep, that is where it's being written. So, uh, if you want to find the, the, the children, you say uh, cwd.list files. I think that'll be that. Uh, for uh, file child and children. This is that dot, dot define child. Yep, so that gives you all the files in that directory. Mm, that, that's great. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Okay, and let's see here. Oh, uh, yeah, is the, is the parser dot parse syntax or parser colon colon uh, parse syntax some sort of referencing? It is. So um, this is called a met method reference. Um, this is all explained in the, the Java 8 uh, lecture. This is just some syntax that they, um, that, that, that they, that they introduced. Um, the interesting thing here is that this isn't actually a call, it's like a delayed call to the method. So like um, this is this is passed into the assert throws inside what we say a, a, a lambda. Um, so it's the whole, the whole idea is that you've got a Java object that represents a method call. It isn't like calling the method itself. It represents the the, the method call. And so then as a result, um, it's the assert throws method that can can decide when to invoke that method, what to do with it, and uh, so that that just that's all part of functional programming to be able to function. That's the right word for it. It's a function then that gets passed around. Um, is it like the um, stuff that you did in CS2? My C++ is really rusty. I don't remember if it works the same way in C++. I kind of think it doesn't though, right? Wasn't that for, isn't that for like referencing like a method of a class or something? Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, I was just wondering if it was like superficially uh, Oh, right, uh, scope resolution kind of operator. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, right. I just remember the scope. Yeah, scope resolution. Okay. C++ no, it, it, so so in that case, I mean, the dot is more like the dot operator in, in in Java is more like the scope resolution operator in C++, right? So if you say like you know class name dot uh, you know method name, you call a static method, uh, for instance, that's you know, that's more like the scope resolution operator. Um, the colon colon here is really give you a method reference to it. I think a function pointer maybe is the same is the closest thing in C++. Oh, I can't remember. Yeah, that sounds yeah, yeah that sounds right. Uh, 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 echoes of Carla yelling, inject your class into your method. Um, I don't even know what that means, but okay. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, okay, any other questions? Oh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, in project three, actually for the pretty print, if the file option is not given, what should we do? Oh, very good question. Um, that is a, is a valid uh, command line. Uh, just pretty print the appointment book with the one appointment in it that was created on the command line. Okay. Very good, yeah. Yeah, okay, fine. So when file option is given, we need to write it to a file. I'm sorry, what, what do you mean by file option? Do you mean the dash text file option or do you mean the pretty print file? Okay, yes. When there yeah, so the command line argument after dash pretty specifies the destination for the pretty. If the destination is just the character dash, then it goes to standard out. Otherwise, the destination is the file to write it to. Okay, fine. And a question also on project three, can we have dash pretty file and dash text file file at the same time, you absolutely can. Um, that is, uh, that's all part of the, uh, the th thing where you would you know, create a new appointment, add to the appointment book, write the appointment book, and then also pretty pretty. 
two questions. And good to get these questions out now, right? You know, in the last couple of days, there's been a, a lot of activity on Slack. I've got a lot of emails of people saying, what about this? What about that? What about that? This is all, and this is all part of the assignment. So please don't think that like you're missing something and, and be charitable with the description of the projects. Um, you know, at, at this point, uh, the, the, you know, the, in this point in your uh, career in the computing sciences, um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I expect and I want to engender critical thinking on your part in terms of, hey, what are some of the, the edge cases? Um, you know, what happens in these various scenarios? Um, and you're all figuring them out. Uh, it's just that there's only one way to learn this, which is the hard way. So I know it's kind of frustrating for some of you um, to, uh, you know, sort of uh, you know, figure out how to navigate all this stuff. And there were some good, uh, you know, uh, questions about your project one grades and stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that project two, uh, you'll, you know, learn, learn a lot of stuff from project one and then can focus on the industry stuff in project two, project three. Any other questions before we dive into project four? Uh, oh yeah, is there a way that grade to specify what brought our grade down? Yes, and I'm sorry, I I should have asked more explicitly. I, I've asked them for project two to you know please say hey you know look, please list which test cases um, failed or were were incomplete um, so that you can know yes um, and, and this is a I mean. It's in their own best interest to tell you this because it'll save them time. Otherwise, it's like, hey, here's an email from you know a student who's confused. You know, let, let's not let, let have that confused. So yeah, I've asked them to do. I'll ask them to do that in project two. Yeah, Andrew. I just have a quick question about uh, project three. Actually, I was reading it because I I wasn't aware we were supposed to output to a file with it. Uh, with a pretty print and I noticed it says a pretty printer class that implements the appointment book dumper interface in the text dumper interface or is there another one that you want us to use it's the same interface right appointment book dumper is the interface that text dumper implements and pretty print uh, okay yep because All right, because so they both you want the same it, things they, you they want dump it to an not be in the class text uh, dumper, you want it to be a specifically new class that still implements that interface. Yes, Pretty Printer is a completely separate kind of concern. They have similar behavior, both inherited from uh, from a point book dumper, um, but they are separate classes with um, separate responsibilities. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, question: Are the overall grades for projects going to be put on D2L? Um, no, but here's what I'll do. Um, probably next week, I'll send out everybody a um, uh, an email with a summary of all your grades to date, just to make sure that you've got everything, um, or that rather I've got everything that that you expect. Um, I, with this many students, I don't want to pay the graders to input all these scores into D2L. I want to pay them to, to grade your stuff. Um, and so then uh, the quizzes are in D2L. The projects who receive the email, I have my own. Uh, grade book which has lots of automation and stuff where it's really easy for me to um, you know report all the grades and stuff and send you emails then but if you ever have any questions please feel free to reach out or it's like hey you know I, 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 I forgot what grade I got and I've lost the email I'll send it to you again no problem um, uh, another question uh, does that mean project 3 will reuse the text parser from project 2 absolutely well yes they'll use it to te parse the text file um, however the, the text parser well, and, and just to be clear, um, the pretty print format is meant to be read by a uh, human and not a computer. So there is no pretty parser. They're just a the pretty printer. But yeah, text parsing is still a part of uh, project two, um, and probably your project four. Okay. Any questions before we move on? Oh yeah, so there's no need to read a pretty printed file then, correct. Uh, it is uh, it is the human is the greater who who's going to read your, uh, your your project your your project three's pretty print file pretty print, pretty file. Okay. Andrew, uh, but we do want to have uh, tests that test the actual output of. 
pretty fringe, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I have one question. Um, I assume file name for pretty and text file will be different, but what if the yes. file names are same for both the options? Very good question. Um, yeah, that's bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> so then you can issue an error if you want. I'm not going to test that scenario, mm -hmm. but uh, probably the right thing to do is to uh, issue an error. Okay, thank you. A uh, question, someone who didn't get a chance to be the driver last time, do they need to attend their pair programming session? No. Um, if you want to experience it, yes, please feel free to. Um, but uh, if you felt that you have gathered enough um, information about what it's like uh, to be to, to pair program, then, uh, you know, fill out the, you know, do the quiz. Uh, tell, uh, tell me what you thought about it. Um, and it's okay to move on. Uh, let's see here. Uh, question that was DM to me: Can we resubmit the project for grading? Uh, yes, you get one of those. Um, and actually, if you've gone to the effort of um, of fixing something, um, I will ask the graders to go to the effort of providing feedback on it. Um, you, know, you know, within reason, they only have so many hours in the week they can allocate to the course. But um, you know, I want you to learn, and uh, I want you to. Figure out if there's something that you you know uh, need to add to your project one. Uh, I, I want your time to be recognized, and so I'll try my best to make sure that we can get you you know some feedback uh, a great on that. Um, question about uh, let's see here. I'm still confused on what your test uh, for the program. I'm oh, sorry. What your test test for the program? Are you testing more happy paths or bad paths? That's a good question. Um, for project one. Let's face it, there's only one happy path, and it's pretty easy. Do you print out the, the, the appointment? For project one, it's mostly about command line parsing, mostly about validation. Yep, that because there's such limited functionality. What I am uh, what I'm testing, what you're being assessed on is your ability to parse the command line to detect uh, malformed inputs and then provide a reasonable feedback to the user on it. As the projects go by, um, as you, you know, if you're adding more stuff in project two, certainly in project three, there's just more stuff to test. And so there'll be less emphasis on, um, on the command line syntax. Doesn't mean there won't be test cases because there will be, right? There'll still be some things about the, the syntax of the command line that I will test, uh, but there'll be other things too. So yeah, if you, you know, uh, didn't, you know, uh, didn't have a good error message or something like that, it's probably not going to hurt you as much, but you should go back to it. Um, so it's, uh, you know, starts off because there's not much else to test with some, uh, with some edge cases, with some bad input. Um, but then as things, you know, go along and certainly by project four, there are things that can go, uh, go wrong that, you know, that it will be tested, but mostly, mostly it's about, Hey, does your program functional uh, program function as expected? These are great questions. Um, let's see here. We talk about these tests that you do. Are they included in the dash P, P grader Maven W configuration? They're not. These are the tests that the grading scripts run. These are tests that maybe I've hinted at in, uh, in you know, my descriptions of the project in what we talk about in class and what we talk about in Slack. But no, these are the, um, the, the tests that, um, that I, you know, the, the, the command line input that I provide with your programs. That's you know, ultimately the, uh, the, the the tests that you don't know about that uh, you know you need to guess at uh, and make sure that your programs uh, do the right thing. I, I will say that uh, you know test cases do get reused from project to project, um, and so then uh, you know it behooves you if hey maybe you missed a couple in project one to go through make sure that they'll work better in project two. Because um, you might see them again. Rather, there's a high likelihood that you'll see some of them again. Actually, there's a certain deal you'll see some of them again. There's a likelihood that you'll see most of them again. Let's move on. 
Uh, so let me change this to see here. Um, an example of how to get the files in the directory. Uh, okay. So, uh, project four. So projects one, two, and three are in the vein of, you know, the traditional computer science 101, 102, 105, you know, the, those first or whatever numbers they use here. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of programs that you write when you first learn how to write, uh, learn how to write programs, learn how to, how to, learn how to code. Um, it's the command line. Your, uh, it, it's and, and it's and it's a single program, and so what you do is you can very easily figure out what your program does. You start at the beginning of your main method, and sure, it might call some other functions and create some objects and do some things, and but eventually it comes back to your main method and will you know return will exit from there. Um, in project four, uh, we're going to be writing a, a RESTful web service for our appointment book, and. There are some new concepts um, that this project introduces, which uh, might be unfamiliar to you. So, uh, you know, I found that uh, many of my students haven't had a lot of uh, experiences with concurrent programming or distributed programming, where you've got multiple processes involved, and they're talking to each other, and you've got multiple things all happening at the same time. Um, and it is, uh, well, an order of complexity, or order of magnitude more complex. There's more things you need to keep in your head. Um, however, this is you know how real software is written, right? You know nothing. There's you know not really a, you know a big monolith these days. There's lots of services that are running. There are things that all happen in parallel, and so it's good to be able to understand how to work with and how to reason about uh, programs like this. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about uh, Project Four. Um, we are going to look at the assignment. We're kind of going to go back and forth um, on things. Uh, so I'll walk through the assignment, then we will create uh, the Maven project for Project 4. So Project 4 has a brand new Maven project because it does things like it runs a web server with some of your Java code in it, and it builds a command line application that has some of your other code in it, and the two talk to each other. Um, and meanwhile, it's got unit tests, it's got integration tests, it's got all sorts of great stuff for, um, for, uh, for, your, uh, for Project 4. Because um, the goal here is for you to just focus on certain parts of it not have to uh, you know, build everything from scratch. So uh, let's let's just talk about this. So project four um, is due on the uh, the twenty eighth, which is only two weeks away, um, and uh, it is it's worth thirteen points. The project trying to get more complex. They're going to take more effort and more learning, um, and therefore they're worth a uh, you know a large percentage of the grade. So what you'll do in project four is you'll take your appointment book application, you'll reuse I th most of the uh, most of the classes um, to uh, take it from a command line uh, project to now a, a single, uh, it runs a single process to a distributed uh, project where you have a REST web service uh, on the back end that stores all the information about appointment book and it's interacted with um, from a, a command line application. And they talk HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, within the web scope on, um, uh, but between the two. This is the point where, where when a person, people are usually screaming and running out of the room because it's so different. But this is really cool stuff. Um, uh, it, it's, it's different and it's, um, uh, it's kind of complex in places, but uh, it's, I've heard feedback over the year that people you know, ultimately enjoy um, and appreciate being exposed to this kind of stuff. So uh, I'm going to talk about some of the code that you have to write and some of the URLs that you have to support, but I don't think it makes sense right here in this moment. We'll see uh, how all this stuff is implemented. So um, there's a class that you'll need to write, uh, or actually you'll get a, you'll have to implement, uh, called appointment book servlet. Now a servlet is a Java object that responds to web requests, responds to HTTP, gets and puts and all that kind of stuff. It responds to rebel requests and um, and returns uh, and returns you know some some value. Um, 
And uh, so you'll, you should implement uh, a servlet that handles the following uh, URLs. So if you invoke host colon port uh, of the appointment book application uh, slash appointments with, uh, if you do a get, well, sorry, uh, owner equals name. When you do a get of this uh, of URL, that will return all the appointments in the appointment book with a given name uh, formatted using the text dumper. So you're using your text dumper from uh, project two that you wrote in project two. Now you're using in project four not to format an appointment book to a text file. You're using it to format an appointment book that then is returned by your servlet um, to the web client. Similarly, if you send an HTTP post to this URL, that will create a new appointment from the parameters in the uh, HTTP request, owner description begin and end. Um, and so now, the, what, what, the, what the server, what the web service supports is the ability to create an appointment via a post to that URL. And notice that if, note if the appointment book does not exist already, a new one should be created. Um, there is also a way to uh, query an appointment book. This is new functionality um, here in project four. So if you do an HTTP get of the URL uh, of uh, with, with appointments, uh, question mark, owner equals name and start equals start uh, date time and end equals end date time. Sorry, it's cut off here. Um, that will return all of the appointment books uh, formatted using text upper again that occur between uh, the start time and the end time. And uh, this date format in the URL, um, whether it's here in the query or whether it's here in the post, is the same as on the command line. That is the date format for project three, which has three components, the date, the time, and the AMPM, the 12 hour time, and the AMPM. A new requirement here, um, Previously, uh, when in your single command line uh, application, you only supported one appointment book at a time. Sure, you can write them in different files. Well, now the uh, the web application can support multiple appointment books, um, and so then you'll need to store all of that. Now you don't need to, it's actually, uh, and you don't store it on a file on disk. You store it in memory, um, and so then for for this, hey, if your web server shuts down, then you lose all your appointment book data. I realize it's not the real world, but that's fine for Project 4, it's fine for this assignment. So we're going to dive into this shortly, but you're going to have this web service that's implemented using an appointment book servlet that provides this functionality. Andrew, I saw you came off mute. Yeah, uh, did you say that we're only storing the multiple appointment books in RAM, as in we're yeah. not outputting it to a file? Or yeah, you don't, need to, you don't need to write it out to a file. Okay, all right. You already demonstrated that you can do that in projects two and three, so. Okay, so one part of your assignment is to provide all of this, this web server, this web application that can uh, serve up those URLs. And then the other part is to have a command line program that interacts with this web service. Yep, you can do it, and we'll see other ways of interacting with it uh, shortly, but um, uh, I also want you to write some Java code that interacts with this. Um, and it's similar, but yet a little different. Um, from the uh, from the other command line programs that you've uh, you've written, and so then it uses HTTP requests to do things like uh, you know create a new appointment book and then uh, search search the appointment books. Sorry, create a new appointment, search uh, the appointment book, things like that. Um, and again, date and time format is the same as in uh, Project Three, so that's the uh, the AMP and the twelve hour time of the twenty four. There is a new option uh, called dash search. Um, and when dash search is provided, uh, you don't need a, a description. You're just searching for uh, uh, appointments between the begin and end time for the given owner. And there's examples down below. Uh, otherwise, uh, if all of the arguments are specified, then you should uh, create a new appointment um, in, the, uh, in the appointment book for the owner. Options are a little different. The command line program no longer writes to a file, uh, no longer, uh, yeah, no, there's, there's no dash text file anymore. There's no dash uh, pretty either, uh, but we'll see the pretty printer is used. Instead, you have options like dash host and dash port, which specify the host and port on which the server is listening. And if you're not familiar with what host and port are, we'll get to those shortly. Uh, you can search, 
Um, you can also uh, print is still there, like it was in Project One, and so is README. So the options are a little different, um, but uh, you know, hopefully your command line parsing uh, can handle all of this. Uh, question: Does this work like APIs, like Facebook has, to get data about the user? It does. It's the same thing, right? So you know, one of the things, uh, and I, I go into more detail in the rest lecture, but you know, some along the way we figured out that. Uh, HTTP can use for, be used for any kind of data. It doesn't have to be web pages. It doesn't have to be HTML and JavaScript and serving up you know, JavaScript and everything like that. You can send any sort of text data over it. And that's actually what you'll be doing here in, in this project, is writing a web application that doesn't return you know, pretty pictures and HTML that gets rendered in the browser. It instead uh, gives you data about your appointment book. I'm glad you think it's neat. I hope that stays that way, but we'll see. Um, here are some examples uh, of how, how to use the, uh, the client. So you'll be running your server in one process, and then you'll run the client in, uh, in another process. And so then when you give it, uh, let's see here, I think this is the right, I think it's still called the point book client.jar. Um, when you give it uh, host, localhost, and port 1305, assuming that's where your web service is running, when you gave it, give it an owner of Dave, description of teach class, and those dates, it'll create one. Uh, if you want to search, then you give it the host and port with dash search, and you don't give it a description. You just give the owner and then the begin and end time. Uh, and then uh, I guess also if you don't uh, specify, if you only specify the owner, uh, then that'll pretty print all of the appointments in an appointment book. The whole idea here is is that all the data is stored on the server, but you interact with it with the client, and that's how you get information about your uh, appointment book. Andrew? Uh, you said we're pretty printing all appointments, but you also said that we're not outputting to a file. So do you mean it'll come out to like oh, the... point to standard out? Yes. OK. Thank you. Another question I had was also um, I've worked in some programs with like this local host situation where it would be like local host th port 3000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I've never been able to get those to work on the PSU Linux server. Um, that does work, though? Yep. Yeah, you just got to find an open port. Okay. And that's usually, usually we figure it too. Yeah. Usually, in my experience, we've used like a web browser to access localhost. Um, I assume there's some way to do that on the PSU server as well. Yeah, I mean, you can say ada dot you know whatever the host name is colon port. I don't think they tie things down very very much, so I think you can still do that. Um, right. But when you develop it, develop it on your local machine, and then uh, you'll have integration tests. You'll have unit tests. Um, that and the integration test. I don't think we're going to go into those tonight so much. Um, maybe well, next time uh, we'll go into the integration tests. Um, but the integration tests uh, run your command line program, um, can call your REST APIs because as we'll see, what Jetty oh sorry, well what Maven does, it starts the web uh, starts a web server for you, deploys your web application to it, and then it can run unit test. It can run it can run integration tests that hit your uh, web server. Okay, so basically what you're saying is as long as we have robust enough integration tests, we don't have to make any kind of specific code adjustments to make it work on the PSU server. Right, nothing I'm aware of. Okay. So yeah, let me know if there's a challenge there. Uh, let's see here, quite a couple questions came in. What could be invalid entries for the dash host option? Um, well, let's see here. Uh, anything that's not a valid host or you know domain name or IP address so whatever the RFCs say there um, you know let the lower level Java apis tell you when you've uh, you've got an invalid host name or a host name that can't be reached and is localhost the only valid option so host uh, sorry it's the only option I will start localhost is the only host we're going to test with um, but you ought to be able to put in any host um, so I guess don't enforce localhost there's no reason to do that. Um, but uh, and we can try it here and see if we can get it, uh, you know, get it working across the internet. Let's get back to the assignment. Uh, as always, uh, if something goes wrong, please provide a user-friendly error message. Um, so you know the usual stuff. Hey, your command line's wrong. Your, your date's not formatted correctly. But now there are other things to worry about can't connect to the server, 
um, the uh, data that's passed the REST URL is not formatted correctly. Um, so now it's, it's not only a matter of, uh, actually, is that, I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember if I test that or not, but um, one of the interesting things about now working with distributed programming, with working with two processes, is that you need to think about where the input comes from. And so then for the command line, the input comes from the user typing in on the command line so you can validate it there. But for the REST API, uh, you should really, you should, you should also validate the information as it's coming into the REST API also. Because you can't trust that the client is always going to invoke your, uh, your API, uh, invoke your uh, REST, REST web service um, with valid data. Phew, so that's a lot of stuff. So, um, this is the project, and that's sort of the, the expectations here. Um, uh, a couple of things here, because I'll go through all that stuff about the project next. Um, if you're looking for ideas on how to write a servlet, there's a family tree servlet that I provide as an example. Um, there's also uh, the HTTP request helper that uh, that the client uses, and we'll see examples of that. Um, I highly recommend that you leverage that instead of trying to use the lower level um, URL APIs and things like that. Uh, back to Andrew's question about running on different ports, there's a way to do that. If you run with a dash D, if you run Maven with a dash D, uh, j.http.port um, uh, property set. Um, and note that uh, you only need to support, submit your Java files and any .txt files and resources and things like that. Um, uh, you do not need to submit your palm.xml or uh, your web.xml. Web.xml configures the web application. You can learn more about it in the lecture. Um, I will, uh, I, I will, I'll copy those into your source code. Okay. So let's, uh, let's figure out how to get started with all of this. So there's a lot of code that I provided for you that you don't need to write. So let's go back. Uh, this, is our, uh, this is our Portland State Java Summer 2021 uh, GitHub repository that we created on the first day. I highly encourage you all to play along at home um, as, as we're going, going through all this to make sure that it works on your environment because um, it's, it's different. It's just like the first day we uh, you know, want to make sure that everybody can create the project for. So uh, there is a create project for script. And uh, just like create project one, it takes your uh, MTX user ID. And so what this does is it creates a uh, new project in your, uh, you know, New project here. It's called uh, it's called appointment book dash web, and uh, um, oh, question DM came in. Uh, you know, if uh, someone's like, "Hey, I haven't finished project three yet. Should I should I start on this?" Yes, you should. Um, I, I I do recommend it. Um, although uh, I think this person is this brand new, brand, is pretty, pretty new to the course. Don't know if they've. Uh, gone through, I think they've created project one. Um, uh, if, they, if things are totally broken, uh, you know, uh, I am me on Slack or something and we can, we can work it out. Um, so up to you. Okay, so now we, uh, we have an appointment book dash web. It looks like a Maven project because it is. Now this Maven project is different from the one that you created for your projects one, two, and three in that, in addition, it, it, it creates more stuff. It is, uh, it's a web application instead of just a command line application. Uh, there's more configuration. If you look at the palm.xml, there's all sorts of good stuff in there. Um, but I'm going to do what I always do. I'm going to uh, chmod uh, plus x my Maven wrapper script. And then I'm going to uh, run thing. Oh, sorry. Uh, and someone just said, hey, I don't have that. Did you run the create project for script yet? Be sure to create run the create project for script first, and then that will uh, that will create the uh, the the app that will create the appointment book dash web uh, directory.
Uh, okay, and then we'll do a clean verify. Oops, didn't I just do a chmod of that? Oh, wait, for that right? Execute. Okay. So we're now building this new uh, Maven project that we have. And it's going to go through and do some stuff that we're used to. It will compile the source code. It'll run the unit tests. Um, but the, what it does after it runs the unit tests is it builds something called a war file. which is a web archive. It's like a jar file, but it's got but it's what a, a Java web application is all about. And Java web applications, yes, they have Java source code. I'm oh, sorry, just they all they have uh, Java classes, not class files. But they also contain things like static resources, uh, like HTML files that might be um, served up or, or you know, images and things like that that are, that are served up by, by the web, um, and a whole bunch of configuration, uh, things like that. What you pri you, primarily what you need to uh, be concerned about is the, um, is the Java code uh, in, in all of this. And then it also ran some uh, integration tests. And what it did before it ran the integration tests is that it started up um, the web application. So there is a piece of open source software, uh, back one more time, okay. Um, the Java programming language, Java programming platform, uh, defines uh, a standard called the servlet standard. The, the whole idea is that this is a Java API that allows you to respond to web requests. And so uh, there's this standard API, is classes and interfaces, just like any other API, that, that specifies, okay, this is something called a servlet, which responds to web requests, and there's an object that represents the request itself and the response to the request. You can get information about that. We'll see this in a minute. You write to that API, you implement one of those servlets, you will call the methods of the, um, of the objects to do the thing that your web application does. In this case, it's going to serve up an appointment book. All of your code runs inside a, uh, it, it runs inside something called a web container. So a web container is, uh, is a program that hosts a web application and the web container is responsible for first of all being a web server, meaning that it listens on a, a, a port for HTTP requests that come in and then uh, routing those uh, web, those HTTP requests ultimately to your servlet. And you can have multiple servlets, you have multiple web applications inside a single web container. All of that logic is provided by somebody else. And in this case, it's somebody else is, uh, um, is, is an open source project called Jetty. And uh, Jetty provides that web container that you can then run your uh, servlet in, run your web application in. Uh, and the, in the integration test, before they run the integration test, it's, they start up a Jetty instance that runs your web application that was just built uh, by Maven. So the integration tests actually run two processes. Um, they first start up uh, this, this Jetty, so it sits there and run, and then it runs your uh, integration tests, right? These are ITs, just like you run, just like you built in projects one, two, and three. Um, but what these things do is they interact with the uh, inter interact with the web, web, web API, with the REST API. Um, this is more traditionally what you think about uh, being a, 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 an integration test. Integration tests are usually uh, require you know, multiple components to be uh, stood up and things running and lots of things interacting. The ones that we were doing in projects one, two, and three sort of were nice training wheel things. It had the magic for getting the you know, standard out and getting the exit code and everything like that, but this is more of a real integration test. We'll walk through all this code eventually, either tonight or next time. Uh, you know, don't worry about it. Um, but there's lots of cool stuff happening there. It runs all the integration tests. It then stops the the web container, and then uh, okay, runs your code coverage um, as also uh, as always, and then it verifies that yes, all your integration test passes. So, uh, oh, question: Should I be concerned that mine ran much faster? It's possible. Um, let's see here. You were in the web directory, and uh, do you see output like it ran all of these integration tests? If you don't, there might be something wrong. So 
So before we start diving into the code, uh, for people who are, okay, well, if you see them, then that's good. Um, then uh, I, I guess you got a nice, fast machine. I guess I'm jealous. I don't know. I like that. Even though it's from 2013. Um, I want to pause here. If other people are playing along at home and trying to get their uh, Maven projects running, um, has anybody who has run the uh, the Create Project 4 uh, script and then went and CD'd into the appointment web app, sorry, the appointment dash web directory, have they not been able to get uh, Maven Clean Build to run successfully? Okay, getting some evidence that, okay. Uh, oh, looks like somebody got bit. Is there anything you want to talk about right now or anything you want to see? Got it. Oh, okay, got it, not got bit. Okay, right on. Okay, uh, by the way, I did create a, uh, uh, a hashtag um, project four channel in, in Slack. If you've got questions, I recommend that you uh, Join that um, to either post questions or to see what other questions uh, people have. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. Do we do a? Uh, yeah. Should we do a Maven clean? Get add and commit. Yeah, you should. Good call there. So I'll I'll do that too. As you can see, there's a whole bunch of um, classes and uh, some SHTML. Uh, it was clean verify. Sorry, I did say clean build, but I might clean verify. So let's commit this, and we will say uh, added uh, project four files. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run that again, and uh, I want all my um, resources and everything like that. The next thing I'm going to do, I got, you know what? I'm not gonna look in the code quite yet. Uh, I want to play with. I want to show you some of the stuff that the project can do, um, and then we'll start looking at. The, we'll take a break, and then we'll look at the code after the break. Um, and I'm going to move my uh, screen around here because I am going to have uh, two things going on at the same time. And uh, we'll want to see things happening at the same time. Okay. So, oops. Let's make it point state Java summer point one point five. Okay. So remember how I mentioned that the integration tests run a web container and then they run the, the tests? We're going to run the web container uh, over here in this right-hand window. Because we're going to see that we have two programs talking to each other. Over on the right here, we've got the web server. So And we run that by saying Maven uh, Jetty for the Jetty plugin to Maven uh, run. So that's going to run uh, Jetty there. And so what that does is... So I built a web application and starts up Jetty and deploys a web application to it. And it's telling you that it's running uh, here on IP address zero, which is localhost um, on port 8080. Now, uh, one of the things I've learned over the years is that not everybody knows what a host and port is exactly. So a host is a computer, um, a computer on a network or on the internet, right? So, uh, and computers have names. Uh, right, like when you uh, SSH into ada.cecs.pdx.edu, ada and all that is the name of the, uh, of the computer. Uh, computers also, computers on a network, on an IP network, also have an IP address, right? Those are those four numbers that are associated by um, dot. Uh, sorry, um, Michael, you wanted me to post a command, which command? The one that started Jetty, probably. 
There you go. This might be in the assignment also, but uh, I will happily post it there. So, uh, again. so anyway, just to kind of networking, computer networking 101, uh, computers have an IP address, which is, uh, it's like your, you know, postal address or whatever, or maybe your, uh, your, your, your coordinate, your, you know, longitude, latitude coordinate or whatever. Um, they all may also have a name. And then every, uh, every machine has, uh, conceptual holes in the back of it, uh, which are the ports. And when you communicate with a machine, you not only say, well, here's the machine, it's like, here's which door I'm going to go through, here's which hole in the back of the computer I'm going to communicate on. And uh, because uh, you want to be able to communicate with different things via different protocols, um, and they have uh, different ports. And so, for instance, there are uh, ports, uh, port ports less than 1024 um, are reserved for special purposes, so you usually can't run programs on yourself. Um, uh, special uh, privileges on the, machine, on the computer. So things like um, port 80 is the HTTP port, 443 is the HTTPS port. Um, all of the, the standard protocols like SMTP, like the, you know, the mail protocol, um, and uh, SSH all have uh, specific ports that they bind to that they run on. And this is a standard that helps you know internet networking happen, helps uh, 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 programs um, uh, communicate with each other over, over the internet or over a network. Um, we're, uh, yeah, like, no comments. Um, like, uh, oh, for, for, uh, for Jetty here, we're running on port 8080, um, and that's running HTTP on, uh, port 8080. So, uh, actually, let's just, let's take a look. So, uh, this is serving up HTTP on port 8080. So, if I go to a web browser and I go to HTTP, localhost 8080, it returns stuff. This is actually something that was returned by Jetty, right? It says it's powered by Jetty. And it's saying, hey, there's nothing at this URL, but if you go to appointment book, which is where I've deployed my appointment book application, I've got something now. And what I've got here is an HTML file, which we'll look at, which is bundled with my web application. It's now being served up via Jetty. Okay, so all of this content right here in the web browser is coming from the program that's running over here in, uh, you know, on the command line, right? Because then if, if I kill my, if I stop my Jetty server and I reload my page, if I load that again, it can't, it can't be reached because the web server isn't running. So I'll run the web application again. And uh, once it starts up, we'll reload the page and we'll see that you can interact with it. Now, out of the box, what is created for you when you run the create project for script is a very simple application, very simple web application. It contains all of the, the pieces, parts you're going to need for your assignment, and then your job is to go in there and actually make it do what it's supposed to do. So it, it has all of the web um, logic. Now, command kill the server, just control C is what I used. Um, you can also uh, run. Maven W, you can say Jetty stop. In a different terminal, right? Yep, it just stopped over there. The control C didn't work. Maybe on Windows, uh, Windows I don't know. Um, yeah, try, try open up another terminal and in the same directory run. Uh, Jenny stop. Okay. What is implemented out of the box with the create uh, project for script is a simple application that uh, is, is a dictionary. It stores um, word definition pairs. I've implemented an HTML page that interacts with the REST API, it's not what your assignment is, although it might help you develop and test it if you're familiar with HTML, but it's good for demonstration to demonstrate uh, that there are different ways of accessing your REST API. So uh, what we can do is uh, we can, if you click submit here, what this does is it loads the appointments, um, uh, the, the appointments URL uh, with no query parameters, which prints all of the, um, 
all, all the entries in the dictionary. There aren't any words in it. Okay, that makes sense. We can create a new word uh, definition like go uh, a deer. We click submit. Well, this is an HTTP post to the uh, to, to the appointment books slash appointments um, URL, and that returned uh, doe as a deer. So define a doe as a deer. And now, if I list all of the words, I get uh, I get this. Let's create another one. Ray a drop of the sun. I created that now. And now if I get the definition of the word doe, it returns doe a deer. So here's what I'm doing. I'm using the web browser to uh, call, and I guess it's not printing anything out, but it could be, um, to call, uh, to, to make web requests of my web application. And it's doing things like storing those values in the, in the dictionary. And now I can query them, right? I can query them uh, again by hitting these various URLs. Um, and so I can hit the URL here in a browser. Um, I can also hit the URL here uh, in, uh, on the command line. So I can say curl, okay, curl, right? Yeah. Uh, curl, um, I can send that same URL. And look, it prints it out. Again, my curl program is calling over to my uh, it is invoke is sending HTTP requests over to my web application here as returning results. The other way I can interact with it is via a command line program, which is part of the uh, the, the 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 project. Um, it's called appointment book dash client. And here, uh, this is like your project four. It's the beginning of your project four main. Uh, and here uh, you've got some uh, pra parameters here. And so then you can say uh, the host is localhost, the port is 8080, uh, me, I call myself, okay. So the uh, next word is me and uh, a name I call myself. You can run, 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 run that here. Um, and uh, then you've got uh, another definition there. Uh, question here, it says I cannot access target slash appointment book dash client. Can you paste in the exact error, please? Um, cannot access. Did you run Java dash jar? Unable to access jar file target slash appointment book. Okay. Uh, are you running on Windows or Linux or Unix? Okay, backslash, not forward slash. Oh, and git bash? Huh. Uh, can you, it, does that file exist? Can you do an ls of target slash appointment book dash client dot jar? Because you have built it, right? Uh, I don't see it there. So did you do a, uh, if you did a, a maven package or a maven verify okay yeah let me know right yeah or maven package so i i can also use the command line application to interact with my um with with, with my rest api so I just uh, defined uh, another another uh, another um, another entry in my dictionary, and now when I get all of them again, yep, there it is. Me a name I call myself. So this is what makes uh, it makes distributed programming powerful. Also, it makes it complex, right? Because you're doing something over here, and it's affecting something over here. This is a little different from what you're used to. Um, and then th so when it comes to building one of these things, you need to now think about what is happening in two different programs. What's happening on the client side, what's happening on the server side. And you need to be aware of the fact that the client might be a Java command line program, 
It might be something that's happening in the web browser, or it might be something like curl. And the whole idea here is that your web application doesn't care who the client is. As long as it sends the right kind of data, it'll respond with the right kind of response. Oh, good, maybe verify work. So uh, that's ultimately what you'll be doing. You'll be writing a web application that hosts information about appointment books, and you'll and it serves it up um, via HTTP, and then you will write a client, um, a command line client that invokes those uh, that HTTP uh, API that sends HTTP requests off to the server uh, to have the user interact with it. See, a couple questions are coming in. Uh, can't access the localhost 8080 site on Safari. Um, are you running? Oops. Uh, maybe run. So let's take a break because we've been talking for a while. I've been talking for a while. You've been listening for a while. Let's take uh, 10 minutes, come back at 646. I will stick around um, and answer some of these questions, make sure that everybody um, is, is sort of keeping up. And then we'll dive into the code next. Um, and we'll see, uh, we'll talk about this that's happening on the server side. We'll talk about that servlet. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll see how to test it. And you test it in some kind of interesting ways. So. Uh, we will uh, we'll adjourn in, in oh sorry we will return in in ten minutes. Okay, we're back. Sorry, I said something, somebody said something about breakout rooms. I had nope. I don't think any are open right now. Oh, I'll delete that one. Okay. Okay. Um. So, seen a lot already tonight. We've created a new project for Project 4, and we saw what it can do, right? You can run this thing called Jetty, which serves up, which creates, which is a web server that you can then access via a um, uh, a, a web browser, uh, a command line tool like curl, or the, the Java program that uh, that we wrote that looks like, uh, you know, command line arguments, and then that all that magic then turns into web requests and interacts with the, uh, with, with the web server. And we'll see more about that later. Um, there was one thing that I, I wanted to show you. Um, I'm running everything here locally on my machine, but I wanted to show you how, if you wanted to, you could run your web server on one of the CS Harvest machines and interact with it from the uh, from the local machine. So I'm going to uh, Control C my Jetty server, which will cause me to lose all my data, but no big deal there. And then I'm going to oops, I don't know why it's bold. Um, I'm going to SSH to my PSU machine, my PSU account, and Portland State Java Summer 2021. So here I am on the PSU machine. I am going to pull the latest changes from GitHub. I'm going to mistype my password several times. That's what I do. Ah, there we go. It's gotten latest changes of lots of stuff, but now I have an appointment book web uh, directory, and I am going to uh, let's see here. I am I'm going to do a couple of things first. I need to figure out what host I'm on. Uh, I am on I believe it's on, I'm on Rita, so I'm going to execute the hostname command. Yep, Rita.ccs.pdx.edu. I'm going to keep that on my clipboard. I'm going to need it in a moment, but first I'm going to run uh, uh, clean. Yeah, I'm just from Jetty. Um, Maven Jetty Run. Oops. Maven W Jetty Run. It's going to build my application. It's going to start up Jetty. It's going to deploy the web application to it. Download all the good stuff from the internet. Okay. It started running. Now it's saying it's running on localhost 8080, but here the localhost is is Rita, right? So if I go back to my uh, web browser here and I go back to my uh, page and I reload it, 
It says that it can't be reached because it's right. This is saying localhost is the web browser on my uh, on my laptop. Uh, it can't reach. Uh, there's nothing running on 8080 because it's instead running on reader.cecs.pdx.edu. And moment of truth, aha, it loads it. And so now it's running over here on Rita. It doesn't have anything to find, but I can add uh, fair definition uh, here. And now, as you can see, I'm running on Rita, and so now I can get them all there. I can also, uh, actually, I'll ask some asked a question. Yes, or someone raised their hand. D post. Uh, yeah, this is sort of a comment on terminology. So localhost points to 127.001, and 000 is actually the address for all, all open, uh, for all interfaces. So if you have multiple cards in there, it's listening on everything. So that's why it's listening on Rita and not just um, localhost. Yes, thank you. You know more about networking than I do. Now we all know more about networking than I do. <laughs> so, okay, so we're running uh, over here um, on, on, on Rita. We've got some information there. Um, I can also then use my uh, command line and instead of uh, going to localhost, I can go to Rita. I can do that me and name I call myself. Uh, there it is. I can. Uh, have it list. So, aha, someone is, oh, very nice. Um, so uh, you can also see everything that's happening on Rita by doing that. Someone figured out that they could uh, go to this URL because it's available on the internet, which they did. And, oh my gosh, I've been hacked. Um, yep. Because I put it out there, someone can, uh, uh, can, you know, can someone can interact with it. There's no authentication, nothing like that, uh, and uh, and so then they're able to access it also. Very nice. Okay. Um, oh, good question. Come in now. Won't uh, one of our programs conflict if five students are running the server at the same time? Will a different port be assigned? A different port will not be assigned. Um, right. People are saying, oh, I see address already in use, and that's why, if you're on Rita. Um, so yes, only one process at a time can uh, listen on a, a given port. And so what I uh, need to do then is to change the port. And I do that by, uh, let's see here, it was listed here in the assignment. Right. I run instead, I run with this. So here it'll be port 8888. So I will change that. Oops, I will just then put uh, port 8888. Nice, now it's running on port 8888. And now if I go back here, I can change my URL to be 8888. And now we have this not have anything because I restarted it, but I can then add things. Um, accordingly. So then yes, please choose a port um, uh, of your own and then yep, uh, people are yep, already finding it. So anyway, it's the internet. It's how things work. And so then this is what we're doing as part of the assignment, right? We're writing one of these web servers um, that will serve up information about, uh, about appointment books. I'm going to stop that. But anyway, so as you can see, this is how you run it, and when you want to uh, configure it on a different port, and I will just I shall paste this. Uh, yeah, that's how you can run it on a. Oops, DM instead. I want everybody. Uh, this is how you can run it on uh, on a different port. Okay, so that's how all of this works on the outside. Now let's start taking a look at how this works on the inside, right? How is all of this implemented? So, um, I am going to, uh, actually, first of all, all, I need to do is I need to refresh everything. I've probably got Maven changes that need to be, let's see here. Right? 
it's, it's thinking about it. Point in the book, yeah, it's trying to do maybe things. It hasn't quite discovered it yet. I'm going to go run my own friend Maven Sync. Who knows all the Maven projects? Thinking about it. Good. I know it's, it's worked because now this is in bold, which means it recognizes it as a Maven project. Let's take a look at some of the source code. Now, these are Maven projects, so you've got your familiar source main test IT. Here in my package, I've got a couple of things. We've got appointment book REST client, appointment book servlet, messages, and project four. We're going to start looking at the servlet. Yeah. Um, a servlet is, okay, I, I was saying uh, before the break that there is the standard Java API called the servlet API. And these are the classes and interfaces that form the contract between the web container in which your, your web application runs and the web application itself. And so what we're doing here is we are providing um, our own implementation of a servlet. So HTTP servlet is the standard API. We are extending that standard API. And what the servlet does is it responds to web requests. Now, uh, you can learn more about this in the, in, in the web uh, lecture. But something that you might not know about HTTP, you might be used to, you probably know what a URL is, right? You know, you know what a URL is. But um, when you interact with a URL, there are various verbs that you can use to interact with it. Um, so when you hit, uh, when you load a URL in a web browser, so I got to turn that thing back on again. Let's see here, now let's run Jetty. Um, I'm running it back on my local machine again. When you interact with a web application, we just like you know load something and load a page in a browser. Um, yep. Uh, we load a page in the browser. What this does is it, uh, it 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 performs the get operation on a URL, the get verb, which basically says, hey, you know, a, a URL um, is an address for something, it's a location of something. Hey, get me the thing at that. Give me the thing at the address. Well, in this case, when I hit, uh, actually, probably a better idea, a, be a better example is appointments. When I hit appointments, this is the content that's returned. It says dictionary on server contains zero words. Okay, so when I get that um, information, uh, I, I, when, I, when I request that URL, um, I, I get that information. There's another verb called post, which is all about sending information from the client to the server in a, and, and the implication that this, this um, uh, transfers information or it creates new information on the server based on what was sent by the client. What uh, those, those requests are handled by methods in the server class, in the server object. So uh, there is a method called do get, which is invoked when this servlet is uh, when, when, when an HTTP GET is performed on the URL that's served up by the servlet. And in this case, um, appointment book servlet is mapped to appointment book slash appointments, right? So when you do a GET there, it's going to uh, perform this code right here. Now, what this appointment book servlet does is it maintains a map of strings, which is the dictionary, which contains well, all the dictionary entries. Um, and so when you do an HTTP get, the get do get method will uh, be invoked and it'll, uh, and it's invoked with two objects. One is an object that represents the request that comes in from the client and the other one re represents the response that goes back to the client. Right, so the whole idea is you get information from the request, you process that information and then you respond with some corresponding data. And that response can be either like, hey, here's the payload requested or if it's like, bad information, then uh, use an HTTP status code, and this is where you get like a 404, your 500, or your 503, or, or whatever. Um, the, the error code um, is all part of the HTTP protocol um, that says, hey, something, you know, something bad is gone, uh, something bad has happened. And so if you look at the logic here, it uses this method called get parameter, which you give it uh, the, the name of the parameter to get, in this case, uh, word. So if I want, uh, let me quick define a word here. 
Uh, right, so now I've got that. So now if I go and I load it, uh, if I load with the parameter uh, word equals me, it just says me, a name I call myself. And that's because when it called get parameter with the word parameter, which is the value word, it returned uh, me. And it says me wasn't null, it's going to write the definition out. Now what write definition does is that it uh, looks up the word in the dictionary. If it doesn't have, a, if it, well, if it doesn't have a value, so like if I say uh, word is Fred, uh, we get a 404 because that's exactly what our code does. It returns a 404. Otherwise, if it can be found, then it goes and it uh, calls this format dictionary method, prints it to the print writer associated with the response. This print writer is a Java IO print writer like many of you might have used in your uh, project too. Uh, the nice thing about the Servlet API is that it reuses the uh, it reuses the print writer API from Java IO, so you have a familiar uh, uh, familiar object type for writing information back to the HTTP request, right, right back to sorry, back to the client in the HTTP response. And again, you set the status there. So I want to go through this one more time, but I want to go through it under the debugger. So a project, uh, you know, I don't know uh, how much you all have used debuggers. I know that a while ago uh, in your like introductory CS courses, they used to use a command line debugger is uh, GDB or something like that. Um, I like visual debuggers. They've been around for 30 years and they're really nice. So um, I want to walk through that whole process again. I'm going to do it under the debugger so we can see how the various processes interact with each other. And um, that's a, uh, that's an important part of Project 4, I found, is to be able to debug things um, because you'll have multiple things happening in parallel. So uh, what I need to do is when I, I, I'm going to stop my Jetty, and I want to be able to run Jetty in such a way that a debugger can attach to it. And the way I do that is, is that I use some stuff in IntelliJ, and I, and I do it in the following way. Um, I go here and I say edit configurations. These are run configurations. I create a new configuration, which is going to be a remote configuration. This means that, uh, sorry, the remote JVM debug made, made a nicer name. Um, debugging uh, happens over a port on a local machine, but it's a distinct from the HTTP port. This is a debugging port. So I'm going to call this localhost uh, 5005. That's just what it, it, it picks. And it says, yes, uh, I'm going to attach to remote JVM on this host and this port. And in order to enable the JVM to accept the debugging connection, uh, we need to add this to the command line for the remote JVM. So I'm going to copy that to the clipboard. And then I'm going to uh, set an environment variable called Maven Ops. So what this does is this adds uh, this adds options to the argument, uh, options to the Java VM that is invoked by Maven. Maven's written in Java, nothing magic there. And so then this means that, hey, when I run Maven, I want to run Maven under the debugger. Or rather, I want to run Maven with the ability to have a debugger attached to it. So that's set an environment variable. So you set the uh, Maven op environment variable thusly, and I will copy that to the uh, the chat for anybody playing along at home. And now when I uh, run Jetty again, it's the first thing it says is listening for uh, transport on 5005. That's saying, hey, you can attach to me with a debugger. And so I run it there. And now back in IntelliJ, I can save that configuration. And now I can use the debug icon to run this localhost 5005. And so what this is doing is it is IntelliJ has now connected to, uh, let's see here, to my, uh, my, my JVM right here. And it's basically saying it's ready to debug. Well, how does debugging work? What you need to do 
is tell IntelliJ, listen, when a particular line of code is, uh, is executed, stop the debugger and let me step through it and let me work with it. And the way you set those breakpoints is that you um, click over here in the gutter next to uh, where your line number is, uh, you know, here in, the, um, you know, in, the, in the, the margin of the page, uh, if you will. And this little red dot means that it, it tells IntelliJ, hey, when, uh, when this line of code is executed, stop the execution, and then go into the debugger. So now, I'm going to go back here, and uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to load the URL with, uh, with me. So I'm going to hit return here, and when I do that, the browser hits my web server, my web server then routes that URL to my servlet and it invokes this code in my servlet. And so the first thing I do is I say, well, what I'm going to send back to the client is plain text. It's something that you do in HTTP. You say, here is the type of content that I'm sending back, right? This is the, the well, content type. This is what it's called. Um, so here is just plain text, but you could have it serve up HTML. You could have it serve up a PDF, an image, you know, any, you know, anything. We need to tell the client, hey, here's what I'm, what I'm sending you. So I'm going to do that. And, and uh, so now, right now it is stopped because this line of code is about to execute. And it can tell me things, uh, you know, the debugger can tell me things about the code that's being executed. So for instance, I can get information about the request object, a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't have too much meaning for me, although I can see that it's got stuff like, oh, look, here's like the, the URI and the server path and everything like that. That's kind of neat. Um, I also have these commands for uh, navigating the code. So for instance, um, this one right here, step over, that will execute the current line of code and go on to the next one. So when I click on step over, it executes that line of code and it goes on to the next one. I'm gonna do that one more time. And now I get some more information over here in my variables. I can see the value of the word, uh, of the variable me, the value of the variable word is me, right? That's the, the, the value of this. And so now I can you know, use this debugger to figure out what's going on. So uh, the word doesn't equal no. So now if I go next, it says, ah, I'm about to execute this right definition method. Well, I wanna see what happens when that method is invoked. So now I don't step over, I step into. And that lets me step into the method. And now when I do, it goes to the right definition method. And now I'm looking at that. So, okay, the first thing I'm gonna do, the, the, the word that was passed was me. I'm going to look that up in my dictionary map to find out that the definition is, oh, is null because I just started over again. Oops, that's fine. Not why I intended, but that's what happened. And so now uh, it tells me down here the definition is null. And so then when this if expression is going to be evaluated, it evaluates to true because it is null. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the status on the response object to not found. And... It's interesting, right now this is a 200, but now I bet if I uh, step over that, response now says that it's a 404 down here. I know it's gonna keep continuing. Now my method is going to exit. Uh, I'm going to continue, because I think I'm here in, in La La Land. And sure enough, I get a 404 in my web browser. Let me uh, populate some data there and try this again. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to hit my my URL again. I'm sorry, I'm going to use my command line tool to uh, create a new uh, definition for the word me. I'm going to reload this page, which once again hits my web server, and my do get method gets invoked. Uh, I'm going to step now into the sort of the same stuff. The word is still me, but now when I step in and I get my word, I see the definition is, ah, a name I call myself, great. So now, definition isn't null, the code executes this uh, else branch, I get the print writer from the response, I format some information there, I flush my print writer just to make sure all the data is written, I'm saying, yep, this is okay, it is response code 200, everybody is happy, I step through my methods, I'm all set to go, I'm done debugging this particular thing, I'm telling the program, go ahead, resume, do your thing, and what that does, it sends back to the browser this text here, me, a name I call myself.
that in a nutshell is debugging. So just to review, when you want to debug a Java process, you've got to run it with some special command line arguments. That's where I set that export maven ops um, environment variable uh, to, to do that. I then ran Chetty. I then attached to the debugger through IntelliJ saying, hey, listen, uh, you know, uh, monitor the, uh, the Java program that's, that they are attached to. And I set breakpoints so that I knew what was going on, uh, or rather, so, so that when that line of code was executed, it would go into debugger mode, it would stop everything, um, and that would let me then step over uh, uh, certain lines of code and then step into certain lines of code when the methods are called. Uh, have you all done much debugging? Was that like a review? Like, oh yeah, I knew all this stuff, or was it brand new? Uh, in chat, um, sort of give an indication of, of how much experience debugging you have. Okay, mix. Some people it's new, some people I yeah, use GDP, been a while. Okay, okay, visual debugging, yeah, might be new to uh, a number of people. Um, question, oh, after saying Maven Ops, yes, it's the same Jetty command again, there's not like special Jetty debug or anything like that. Okay, good. Okay, um, hope that was helpful. Uh, debugging is an important part of software engineering. Um, there's one other method that I want to uh, walk us through, and that's the post command. Okay, uh, the post method. So do get is when I uh, just just hit a URL, just request a URL. Post is a different verb that, like I was saying before, sends some data to the server, and then the server usually changes something, mutates something, either creates or maybe updates. Um, uh, you know, like upload an image, you would do that via a post. Those kinds of things. And so let's see what happens when we when we post some data. Um, here I am going to. How am I going to do that? Well, I'll just go back in there. Actually, no, I'll do it. So there, there are different ways, you know, or rather, you know, you can invoke. Uh, so, so, so when I run the command line application with four arguments here, uh, it does an HTTP post. So I run that here. Oh, look, again, it made the HTTP request. It got routed to this do post method. And now I'm debugging it. So once again, we're saying, well, I'm going to replay, uh, going, to, going to respond uh, to you with some plain text. Uh, there are some parameters that it that it wants. One is the uh, the word parameter, uh, and it gets the word is doe. It gets the definition parameter, which is a deer, a female deer, and then it puts that in the dictionary. It then writes out a message to the HTTP response says everything's okay, and then goes along its merry way. Oh, and sorry, I've been using F8, which is the, um, uh, the keyboard shortcut for this. And now I will resume. And uh, what was written was define doe as a deer, a female deer. So debugging is, is helpful when something uh, you know you don't understand is is happening. Um, uh, for um, you know, and, and it's even more important in this project when you have the client talking to the server and it's not always clear like what, what's happening. There. Uh, so there's a question: uh, Does the REST API we are using allow us to define specific endpoints and have a method for handling each endpoint instead of uh, catch all do post do get? Um, the way you would define multiple endpoints with multiple servlets, um, well, that would be, I think it's what you're getting at. If you want multiple endpoints, you have multiple servlets um, within the same web application. You can also, and here the web application corresponds to the slash appointment, uh, you know, appointment book URL, and then the servlet is the appointments within that. So you could have multiple web applications that would serve, you know, have different routes, um, and then have all sorts of different endpoints in that. Uh, did that answer your question, Dylan? Yeah, let's see. 
But for this assignment, you've only got one endpoint. By going back to the assignment, oops, back to the assignment, uh, you've really only got one endpoint, which is the point book appointments. So one servlet. But what then we have to do is handle um, different verbs, and then also handle uh, different query parameters on the URL. Oh, uh, multiple servlets sounds like uh, a, a big deal. Um, maybe it depends on what the endpoint's doing. Um, overall, it's, it's, it's pretty small. Now, uh, what I'm showing you is uh, you know, writing servlets. Um, this is sort of the lowest level of, of, well, of, servlet pro of web, web programming. Um, lots of people have, I mean, there are gazillions of web frameworks that purport to do things easier, and you can have annotations, and you can have all this configuration and stuff. Um, what I want to get across in this class is like just these fundamentals. And so, yeah, what we're doing is kind of clunky um, in places. And you know, if any of you have done this, uh, you know, in a professional context, yeah, you're not writing your own servlets. Most likely, you are using other frameworks that are built on top of servlets. But everything is built on top of servlets, so that's why I decided to um, cover it here in the class. That and I don't, other than like Google Juice and JUnit and stuff, I don't want to sort of have uh, this class be about frameworks because um, they change, they get out of date, they go out of fashion, uh, you know, things like that. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, uh, someone recommend uh, Postman uh, for API testing. Yes, yeah, Postman's uh, really cool um, for doing that in Senate Pro. But ultimately, what you'll, well, yeah, but you also write the, the, the Java program. And you can write unit tests. And that's what I want to cover next. Um, so we have uh, this, this servlet. And the servlet has logic in it, um, right? I mean, you know, you, you send in some uh, data in the request, and then it interacts with something in the response. And uh, you know, we're good software engineers. We want to make sure there are tests for these things. And ideally, what I'd like to be able to do is exercise the servlet without having to run a web application, because, I mean, it takes a long time to start up the, um, the container and everything. I'd like to be able to create, create this. Uh, treat this just like uh, you know, any old piece of Java code and write a simple unit test for it. But this code is invoked in the context of, uh, a, of a web application. How do you test it? Right? How do you create an HTTP servlet request and send it to my do get method so that I know it does the right thing? Well, if you look in the tests, there is something called the appointment book servlet test. And uh, this is uh, a unit test that I wrote that allows you to unit test the appointment book servlet without starting up Jetty, without sort of running it for real. What it does is it uses something called a mock API to um, interact with the, the servlet object. This is pretty advanced stuff. This uses a, a, an API called Mockito to basically what are called, when create mock, um, things like a, a mock HTTP servlet request, a mock HTTP servlet response, what we can do is you can create these mock objects, and these mock objects um, have a special property that they remember how they were interacted with. And you can sort of pre-program them to respond to certain method calls uh, and things like that. So here I have a, a unit test um, that validates that when a new servlet is created, the dictionary contains no entries. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to interact with the do get method uh, in such a way that I can then verify that, listen, when I go to request all of the uh, entries in the dictionary, that I get zero back. And here's how I do that. First of all, I create my servlet object, um, which is the object under test. So I create a new servlet. And ultimately what I want to do is I want to call the do get method and I want to send it some request and some response, but I need to send it a special request and a special response. I'm going to uh, send it what's called a mock servlet request. And so there's this API called Mockito, um, 
which you can, has this magical method called mock. And what you do is you give it a Java line class of a particular class, and it returns an instance of that class that lets you do some magic things. So for instance, here, I create a mock response and uh, also a mock print writer, I suppose. And I, I say the following. I use this when method, which is also part of the Mockito API. And by the way, all this is explained in the dependency injection uh, lecture. I say when the get writer method on my mock response is called, then return, then I want my get writer method to return my mock print writer. This is the magic of this Mockito library. It allows you to create all of these fake objects and configure them the way that you want. But then you create all these mock objects, you can send it to your real code, your real do get method. And your do get method, it doesn't know that it's dealing with mocks, it just knows that it's dealing with uh, objects that, per, that um, implement the HTTP servlet request, HTTP servlet response interfaces. And uh, it goes and calls methods like get writer. And when it does that, it actually gets this mock return, mock print writer, but it doesn't care. It, it, you know, uh, these objects uh, program to the interface, they provide the contract that they're expected. But the bottom line here is that uh, you can call your do get method, it does what it does, and then you can verify that, what, uh, that the do get method, the code under test, interacted with these mock objects in the way that you expected. So for instance, this test verifies that the print writer, so our mock print writer here, had his print line method called with the value messages.formatWordCount, which is exactly, if we go and look at what do get does, I'll just bring it up here in another window. Move this to the opposite group. If we look at do get, and then we say uh, write all dictionary, because word is null, we see that uh, format, format word count. Format word count. Oh, maybe it's not called there directly. Uh, must be format dictionary entry. Interesting. Will this work? Uh, I expect that. Oh, okay. No, no, no. I think I missed it. Huh. This actually work. Okay, so that worked. Why did that work? You know what? I can uh, I can debug it, and now I'm oops. Is that called? So I can then run this on the debugger, and when I do, you get. Oh, there's that. There's that. You don't want to stop at that breakpoint. I want to stop at this breakpoint. Oh, sure enough, do get calls write all dictionary entries which calls format dictionary entries, which calls format word count. Cool, okay, so that code is is invoked as I would expect. What's uh, that? Anyway, and, and so then verify is a lot like assert. It basically, uh, you know, asserts that yes, print line was called on this mock object with that string and also it it verifies that the set status method on the response was called with SCOK. This is how you write unit tests when you're working with these external APIs. Um, you have to, 
you, you, you're not running inside the uh, you're not running inside the web container because um, you want to run quickly. You don't have to start the whole web containers to run your unit tests. Instead, you have to sort of pretend um, that you're you're in a you're in a web container, and the way you do that is by mocking out the objects that the get code needs to interact with, namely the HTTP servlet request, HTTP servlet response, and the print writer. I've got other examples here of the uh, of how to use Mockito. I'm not going to walk the uh, walk you through them right now. Um, instead, what I'll uh, well, what I'll leave you with is, um, uh, is is the code here. This is all part of what's there in your project fours. Um, but I do recommend though that you study this stuff because it is possible to do test driven development for your servlet. And I recommend that you start with the unit tests. Um, and maybe we'll bust into some of that next week. Um, uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, let's see here, it's 7.30 now. Any questions? I'm going to take just another minute or two and walk through some of the other parts of the source code, but I do want to make sure we have enough time for the pair programming. So there are a couple of other um, classes in here that are, are interesting. So the, the servlet is used on the uh, server side. It's used in Jetty. But there's a whole bunch of other code that isn't used in Jetty. It's instead it informs in your um, client, um, right? It's used on the client side. That is, you know, the program that we ran over here uh, that uh, that calls the, the REST API. And that's in your project four. It's got a main, right? So it parts the command line, you know, pretty much like we're used to. You know, I've been doing that for several weeks now. Um, let's put that over here. And at parsing the command line, it uses this class called a point of book REST client. So the way that I recommend that you structure the code is that you have the command line parsing, uh, at the main method, do what it's good at, which is parsing the command line, and then leverage this appointment book REST client to actually make the calls off to the um, off to the REST API. And so then it has uh, methods like get all dictionary entries, which will eventually do uh, HTTP get. It has methods like um, uh, get definition for a word, and then add a dictionary entry. And so then, if you go and look at how, what these things, what, what these things do, they uh, they perform the HTTP get or the HTTP post. And uh, I have some helper methods here, like that's called get, which will perform uh, HTTP get on uh, the URL, and the URL is passed into the constructor, or rather, is formatted in the constructor based on the host name and the port, and then things like appointment book and appointments. And then get. Um, has a map of uh, parameters, the key value pairs that you end up sending to it. So when you just call get all dictionary entries, it invokes, uh, oh, it, 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 invo it, 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 invo it invokes, it does a get of the URL and doesn't pass any, any parameters. Uh, get definition, on the other hand, it performs a get also, and it passes, but, but the get definition method takes in uh, a word um, and then passes that to the get URL um, as the uh, as the parameters to that URL. So this is the um, you know the uh, key value pairs that are passed on the uh, yeah like word equals me, right? So those, that is what's in this map are the uh, the key value pairs that then get appended to the URL that is uh, is sent to the server. And so then it performs the get, it returns, and, and the get method returns this object called response. And response um, has a method like get content, which will return the string of you know, the content that was included in the response. Um, it also has uh, a way of getting at the HTTP uh, status. And so uh, the way this REST client works is that unless your status is HTTP OK, then you're going to throw something called a REST exception. 
the nice thing about using an exception here is that it kind of hides the fact that you've made this rest call and, and everything. This way you don't need to like um, have methods return like an int code or something weird like that. It's Java code, something's gone wrong, so you should throw an exception. So this, uh, this client um, is another important part of your application. It resides on the client side and it interacts with the, uh, with the servlet. The final part is the um, add, uh, add dictionary entry, which takes a word and a definition. This is passed in the command line. And then it calls this post to my URL uh, method with, uh, with the word and the definition. Um, and then, I don't know, I don't know why it's visible to, oh, it's probably visible for testing so I can send in bogus data and, uh, and have it fail in a certain way. So this is the way, this is the client. And so I recommend that you separate out the, the main method, the command line parsing from the client code um, then, which it just really focuses on uh, invoking the, the, the REST API, doing the gets, doing the, uh, the posts. Oh, what does that annotation do? Visible for testing? That's a very good question. Um, it actually doesn't do anything, but what it does is it conveys to the reader of this code that the reason that this method isn't private is because it's called in a test. Um, so, uh, you know, if we look at where this code is, where this method is uh, called, oh, it says that it's not called anyplace else. Well, that's surprising. Maybe that is an indication then. What about record client? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, this, is, this doesn't have, oh, no, there it is. Post to my URL. Right. So, here is an integration test that uh, validates that you can call the, um, that, that when you post uh, with no parameters that you get uh, in, in response uh, a 412 error code. That's what that thing does. And so in order to do that test, I needed to have uh, this post to my URL method be uh, non-private. Because when you define, so like um, when you add a dictionary entry, it does a post, but it always passes in a word and a value. Well, here we wanted to be able to pass in no values just to make sure that it broke. So it's basically saying, hey, I'm making this method visible, so not private, um, for testing purposes, but not for like general use. Okay, that's project four. And as, as you can see, <coughs> there's a lot more stuff here than there was in projects one, two, and three. Um, feel free to get started on it, but don't worry about it too much. We'll be, di we'll be doing another deep dive into this uh, next week. Um, as we see more about how to run the integration tests, uh, write unit tests for the application, um, things like that. Any questions before uh, we should probably take a little break, take another 10 minute break, and then come back for the second part of the pair programming. Any questions on project four before we, before we do that? Okay, let's take 10 minutes then, reconvene at 7.45. We will introduce another code kata, and then we'll do some pair programming. And again, if you did pair programming last week and you got it out of your system and there's other things that uh, you want to do with your time, please feel free to do them. Otherwise, um, people that didn't have a chance to participate last week or just want more pair programming, it's an opportunity coming up shortly. Okay. Okay, we're back. And see here, we've got 23 people here in the, the Zoom. Um, you know what? I have no idea how many people were here last time. So if you could use the, um, sorry, the reaction 
which I don't even know how to do here. Um, if you use the reaction, um, raise your hand if you were here last time and got the whole introduction to pair programming, um, or, or I guess watch the video. So who here is sort of like ready to pair program right now? Well, thanks for indicating. Uh, I okay. was not here, but yeah, I did watch the video. Okay. Uh, I'm just wondering like how, how much I, I, I need to do. So how, how about this? I'll talk about the kata. And then anybody who's like, I'm ready to go, I'll, you can go off into breakout rooms. And then there's anybody who's like, what are we doing here today? Uh, I, I can give you, uh, give you a review. So uh, tonight's kata is called Number to LCD. And so I will post uh, the link here. Uh, but yes, the rest is pair programming tonight. So if you've... Uh, you did pair programming last night, and you don't feel like doing it anymore, or is it last time, you don't feel like doing it anymore, feel free to drop off. That is the, the kata, and as a reminder, these katas are, you know, little uh, programming, uh, little programming projects, little programming assignments, if you will, that uh, help you explore a new language or help you, uh, you know, do something like test-driven development and sort of uh, uh, learn here. And so the whole idea is that um, in, this, uh, in, th in this program, there in this kata, uh, we, we take a, a given number, some, you know, uh, a number that comes in from the command line or, or whatever, and converts it to like LCD style, like, like your alarm clock type thing, or maybe your wristwatch from the 80s, um, uh, style of numbers uh, like this. And uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah, each digit is three lines high. So, uh, geez, three lines high. That's true. So there's like, one line of underbars, and then there's a line of um, of pipes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so then uh, the, the the goal of the kata is to to write a program, uh, or to write some code really that takes in a number and then uh, formats uh, formats a string or prints out uh, LCD display like this. There is a, a part two. Um, that makes it bigger, um, and uh, but uh, I don't know if you're going to get to that or not. Actually, I mean, you know, don't try to skip ahead. Just go ahead and focus on this one. Um, so if you are all, uh, all, all okay, sorry. Any questions about the uh, about the kata that we'll be doing tonight? Let's see here. I will create. Oh, let's go ahead and create twelve breakout rooms, um, and I will let uh, I'll let each of you um, choose which room to go to. Um, I'll also keep a couple open if there's anybody who wants to just talk to me about stuff. Uh, so I'll create the breakout rooms now. You can go ahead and assign yourself. Um, and uh, anybody though who has questions about how to approach Parrot programming or how to get started with the GitHub repository. If you didn't create a GitHub repository for your pair and mob programming, um, stay online um, uh, and, uh, and I can get you started there. Hmm. I forgot to open the rooms, sorry. There we go. Now you should be able to assign yourselves to a Oh, for the pair programming, I don't have any repository right now. So can I join any room or then can create yeah. that? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Do, do you, um, I'm sorry, wait. Do you say you didn't have a repository created yet? No, not for the pair programming. No. Okay. Yep. So you can either, you know, if, uh, if there's someone who wants to, I'm sorry, I didn't see who that was who was speaking. That was... Yeah, hi, I am Akansha. Oh, okay. Hi, Akansha. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if anybody wants to uh, pair up with Akansha, if you have a... Uh, 
that we have a repository created already. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, I'll post I'll post that too. Let's go back to the getting started repository. Come on, there we go. State job of getting started. There we go. Basically, what you do is you follow these same directions that we did on the uh -huh. first night, um, but create a public GitHub repository. Um, it's probably easier though to go find someone else that's already done it. It'll save you, you know, a handful of minutes. I know it took some people, you know, like ten minutes last time to get started. Okay, so can I join any room for that? Uh, well, there are already pairs in each room. Um, let's see here. Oh no, I think there's one room eight now only has one person. So yeah. Yeah, go see and always you can always come back here if uh, if you need okay. some help. So room eight, right? I believe so. Yep. Okay. Okay. For the people that remain here in this main room, uh, does anybody need help with? Uh, getting started with pair programming. Is anybody here for just like some one-on-one -on -one time with me? Yep. At office hours. Okay. Cool. I am going to then pause the recording. We will get started with that, um, and then uh, yeah. Okay, so we are we're back. Um, had a handful of groups that um, our uh, let's see here that, that that did some pair programming, and I just like to spend a, a couple of minutes just talking about like what your experiences were. Um, if you want to share any of your code, uh, you know, or talk about your approach that that, that you did, um, I'm just curious to hear uh, what what you did. I just wanted to um, before I, before I do though, I just wanted to reiterate uh, a couple of things about. You know the purpose of this exercise. So, um, you know the katas are there as as a learning tool. Um, unlike the projects, you will not be assessed on your code in um, in, in any respect. I suppose the only time, the only thing I, I, I reserve um, is you know if uh, if we look at your GitHub repository and there are no commits, like you didn't do anything. It's like okay, that's that's a little suspect. But I know y'all did. Um, and uh, uh, really, it's about experiencing pair programming, and then thinking critically about. Um, what you observed and what it meant, what was ineffective, what was effective, um, sort of what, what you think. That's what I'm. Uh, that, that's what you'll be assessed on in that uh, that D2L quiz, um, which is your reflections on pair programming. Um, okay. Well, I'd like to uh, ask someone from room one, and that was uh, Ji Hui, uh, Catherine, and Li Huang, um, about your experience as pair programming. So. Could or one or more of you come off of mute? Talk about what you what you did. And if you want to show off any of your code or anything that you did, you can feel free to do so. Yeah, I'll speak for them. Okay. So basically, what we did was that we tried to we tried to get our role set up and defined, but it turns out that. It turns out that one of my partners, Catherine, wasn't so used to being the driver. So I decided to become the driver for the night and she would help me figure out some of the intricacies of this project. And what I found out with this project is that merging those LCD numbers into like one, two, three, four, five is a lot harder than I thought. So what we decided to start with first was to just take care of the single numbers. So let me share with you my screen. David, can you can you confirm if you can see my screen? Yeah, looks great. Awesome. So what I have here is some pretty basic code, but what it does is that it's going to take in the number that the user passes in as the argument, and then it's going to try and parse it into the LCD form. For now, all with that our team was able to get done was that we could take a single number and then transform it into LCD format. 
and we got the numbers covered from one to nine. I'm not sure if we were supposed to include zero in it, but that could be for later. And in either sense, when I go to run the code with a one, it's gonna give us something like the LCD number printed here. If I do something like eight, it's gonna give us something pretty close to what the website expected. So while we do have something, it's not exactly like what it expected. No, that's a great start. Okay. Um, did you do this test driven? Did you write some uh, unit tests for this or were you just writing the code? Uh, I did one unit test for it, but that was just, that was about it. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing. Does anybody uh, else, anyone else from uh, room one have anything they'd like to add? Or does anybody else um, here uh, on the call have uh, anything they, any questions they have or anything they'd like to point out with regards to the pair programming in room one? Well, thank you very much, Lee. Thank you, Next David. Up is uh, room three with Dylan and Eric. Uh, yeah, I mean, overall, it was a pretty positive experience. Uh, I started out as the driver, and I mean, overall, I think it was a little bit short because we didn't really have uh, enough time to go to switch twice, which probably would have been ideal. Um, we only switched once the amount of time, or maybe we need to make our swaps faster. I don't know what to do. Um, but yeah, uh, overall reflections are it was fun, but short. Okay, hey, room seven with Margarita, Matthew, and Sam. Um, so we were able to use the um, the pair, the group programming um, with uh, IntelliJ and oh, code with me. So yeah, code with that. me. Yeah, yeah. And um, this ended up being really great. Um, it's a little hectic because like if if people are using like keyboard shortcuts like copy and paste or undo um, they they conflict with each other and it can cause a little bit of mayhem and um, but as long as we're communicating it works and we didn't get to do a whole lot but you can see um, Margarita and I set up this two-dimensional string array that's going to um, it's going to create a um, each digit by line so this first th this first set of strings is the number one this next set of strings is the number two and so on and then um, and then um, we also did this um, parser, got this parser going, and that, that's kind of as far as we got. Um, we're still working on um, maybe setting up some sort of switch state thing down here. Nice, yeah, that's an optical good start. And yeah, you converted the, uh, the the input into a yeah into a number. And yeah. yeah, good. And we we just divvied it up like um, Sam was working on the parser, and um, Margarita and I were working on coming up with some sort of array system, like a matrix sort of thing. Cool. Oh, it's interesting that you sort of did this divide and conquer thing. So it wasn't necessarily like the driver and the navigator, right? It's not like you were able to uh, be, because you could collaborate on the code. You were working on different parts of it concurrently. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think that made it easier because it's it's kind of a it's kind of a big brain idea to just suddenly jump into. So um, rather than try to try to figure out the the whole algorithm, we just started writing stuff, and it kind of worked out that what that um, it we divvied it up that way. So <laughs> nice. Sam or Margarita, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I just really enjoyed using the IntelliJ. Uh, it was really, because we actually initially had 
already uh, kind of spent a little bit of time just setting up the GitHub. Um, and then we didn't even know how we were gonna go about that. And I remember you said you could just use the code with me and that took a little bit of time too, but after we all got onto the same files, it, it was pretty, it actually made it a little bit more fun just to know that like we were all coding at the same time and we're all seeing everything in real time. So I really enjoyed that part. Um, and because there was three of us, we all kind of, there was no driver or navigator. We kind of all just pitched in, um, kind of just going off each other's ideas and stuff. Cool. Should we be linking or should we be pushing this to GitHub? Because we, we, yes, we didn't really use GitHub once we, once we set up the, um, the code with me. Yes, please push up to GitHub um, and that way uh, you know, the, the, the graders was to take a quick look at it, just to make sure that you actually did something, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, please make sure that there's there's code up there. Okay. Cool. And, and just to be clear, um, it's, you know, these are public GitHub repositories. And so even though it'll be in like, you know, one person's uh, re you know, repository, everybody can point to that in their, um, in their quiz. So please be sure to share the URL with everybody on your team. Thank you, room seven. Uh, room nine, Cody, Cody, and Matt. Yeah, I can talk. We uh, took a little bit of a different approach for the actual coding um, and for the pair programming. We, I was actually in the last class we did pair programming and I spent a lot of time just trying to get stuff set up. And so this time, uh, you know, we had it running and stuff like that. And then we spent some time trying to get the run with me on IntelliJ going, but then we ended up just doing the driver with the, the people behind them because I just wanted to make sure we got it going. I can share real quick. Um, so, um, we check command line arguments. If it's zero missing, if it's anything other than one, it's too many at this point because we are only taking in one number. And then uh, we broke it up by line because in order to print something out, like if you've ever tried to do ASCII art, you can't like just make a thing. You have to make lines and you have to try and make those line up. And so here's our top line function. Uh, the first thing we do is we get the length, which we honestly didn't even probably need to pull this variable in, but that's fine. And then we pull in the original string with the length, we build a string builder, and then we have a for loop with a switch statement that goes through, and assigns each of them a value based off what the top of their number needs to be. And then that loops through, each time it loops through, it'll give it a space, so there's space between. And then it prints that entire line out at once, as opposed to doing each individual number. And we do the same for the mid and the bottom. And then I have it built in right now with the number 90, 91. So if we run it, we can see that it has an illegal start of expression, which is super cool. Oh, there you go. And so we get 90, 91. Um, looking at the second part, this could be more of a hindrance than it is a good thing to do it line by line. I think maybe like you would still have dedicated top, middle and bottom sections, but then you would have to build a function that was like mid upper and mid lower that was able to take care of like the space between what are the core. Cause like really it's the horizontal dashes that you need to worry about. And so if you have those lined up, then you're good. But that's something that we were gonna work on next. But I'm, I think we're all pretty, happy with how it turned out and how we work together. Yeah. Cool. Good progress. Anybody else from room nine want to weigh in on their experiences? Uh, this is um, actually similar to individual programming, but um, it was funny just like right as we were finishing up the uh, breakout rooms, I realized that we could have done this all in one function and just had a like top string, middle string, lower string, and then had one switch statement. And I was like, oh, we totally could have cut our code in half and third. But um, 
yeah, anyways, I just found that that was funny because that happens to me all the time, individually programming. Um, and, but yeah, no, it was nice. And it seemed like, you know, it's, you like catch syntax errors way faster and um, it's fun to kind of like bounce off, you know, ideas off each other. And also I think you think more about your ideas when you have to try to explain it to someone else, which um, probably helps you stop from going on, going down um, <clears throat> like, you know, uh, dead end runs. So yeah, it was good. Good, excellent. Okay, and let's see here. Last but certainly not least, room 10 with Kancha, Harsha, and Shweta. Uh, I, I can talk for room 10. So um, last time we uh, pretty much wasted our <laughs> whole session with the set of setting up process, GitHub, and then uh, code with me feature. And then, yeah, we, we didn't do anything much last time. So we were just, uh, we thought maybe we could give it a try this time. So we, we just uh, we just continued whatever we left off. So uh, if I can share my screen. Um, so yeah, this is what we uh, got, what we uh, did now. Uh, so uh, the pair programming, uh, we, we switched roles within with, uh, with ourselves. Once I was the driver and the once she was the driver and then yeah, we switched the roles between us. Uh, if I if I wrote the test cases, uh, this she wrote the uh, the main class methods, and then uh, we switched roles. She wrote the test cases, and I wrote this. And uh, yeah, there are there are some uh, things we we missed. Like uh, there are some obvious things we I can I, I didn't see that at first, but she she pointed out that hey, you you should write this before this uh, condition, and I was like, oh yeah, we we were able to refactor that, and then. Uh, uh, yeah, that that's the way we we did the pair programming, and it was fun. Excellent. Cool. Well, you're yeah. doing a comment from last time. No problem with that. It's uh, yeah. not really what you did, but yeah. Nice, and you did test driven. Sure. Yeah, I, I we really did uh, test driven development. So yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Well, hey, uh, thank you uh, so much for sharing your experiences sharing your code um i i I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh you know a number of you found it to be a, a worthwhile exercise um next time we're uh going to some mob programming which is different you'll be working with at least three other people um uh you know we have a lot of people in this class so we might do uh, mobs of like oh, i think up to five maybe um and with tools like code with me i, th I think it's got uh, you know we have some interesting um, options in terms of the dynamic and how it works and who controls the keyboard and who's who's doing what so i'm really interested to hear how that goes we'll be doing katas uh another kata a newer one it'll be a little bit more complex so you got more uh more, more people on it but and hopefully someone in the mob will have a repository that we can use so we don't need to worry about um doing all of that again um let's see here well that's all the content that i had for uh tonight any questions um or uh, comments feedback before we leave Yeah, where can we find the quiz or survey that we're supposed to be taking? Oh, yeah, it's on, it's on D2L. Okay, thank you. Um, yep, it's called Reflections on Pair Programming. It's also linked to on the on the course website. When is it due? Next week. And actually, yeah, thanks for uh, bringing that up. I wanted to, uh, let's see here. Let's just talk about next week. Share my screen one last time. Yep. So uh, next week, week five is a big week. There's lots of stuff due. So project three is due. The uh, the cones are due. There's a quiz. There's also a midterm survey. So this is just sort of a check-in, saying how things are going. This counts as a quiz grade. Um, and then the reflections on, on pair programming. Um, so lots of stuff to focus on uh, this week. Let's see here. Yep, and uh, but then uh, after that, you'll be focusing on uh, on project four, and next next week um, we'll start uh, you'll start learning about Android, but we're really not going to dive into it until week six. Um, this is where we'll see um, we'll we'll set up Android Studio and create our project and things like that. Next week, um, sort of during class time proper. We will uh, be diving more into Project Four, learning more about the uh, 
the unit tests, how to develop those for both the servlet and for the uh, and, and developing integration tests for what happens on the uh, on the client side, and then uh, do some mob programming, building a, 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 another code kata. So, excellent. Hey, uh, quick question. Uh, yeah. Maybe you said this, but I, I missed it. Uh, what is the uh, midterm survey is about? It's um, okay. So it is not a midterm exam or quiz or anything like that. I, I want some feedback on how things are going in the course. So um, it's it's you know uh, simply I think it's probably just one or maybe even two questions. I'm um, just asking you how things are going and uh, what some of your observations are um, uh, about the course so far. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Um, related question, and then also same question for the pair programming quiz. Um, how long should we expect the survey to take, and then also the pair programming? Uh, ten minutes each. Oh, really? Okay. You know, ho hopefully, I, I mean it's it, it's you know it's just uh, well, it's thinking of reflection. So I mean, I I, I, eh, I use words can take me a long time. So I mean, uh, th th this is not uh, like you know these are not yes or no questions. This is an open-ended, um, you know, one or two paragraphs type thing. So um, really it's asking, uh, you know, about what your experience has been and what did you think was effective? And so I want to, you know, I want you to think about and think critically, um, you know, about those things. Um, but it's, uh, not, how much of the grade is your survey? I, I think it's worth a quiz grade or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So it's like, yeah, three, three points or something. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anything else for tonight? Yeah. Well, hey, thanks uh, for taking some time to pair program. Have a great week, everybody. Um, I'll be watching for your messages on Slack and, and email. Um, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll stick around for a couple of minutes. People have some, uh, some more questions that they want to ask me uh, individually. Have a good one, everybody.